Good morning and welcome, welcome to our morning service and especially welcome to you if you're watching online. We're absolutely delighted this morning that we have Chris McNee with us. And I know... Wow. Does Kevin get a cheer? No. <laughs> For those of you that are new to us, and I know there are some of you, um, Chris and Christine were members here for many, many years, and they've done a number of roles in this church, and when they moved three and a half years ago, they were very, very much missed. And so it really is a pleasure to have them back with us this morning. So we look forward to what Chris is going to bring to us. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Indeed, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Lovely to see you all. So many familiar faces. Quite a number of faces I, I don't recognize, too, which is brilliant. Christine and I are delighted to be back. We really are. And we look forward to catching up with a good number of you um, at, the, uh, at the end of our service. But we're here principally this morning to worship God. And so let's hear some words that the psalmist wrote, um, which will help us, I hope, to focus our minds on the living God. Psalm 145 begins like this. I will exalt you, my God, my King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. Let's worship God, shall we? In the words of our, our opening uh, song, Jesus is King and I will extol him. and girls and grown-ups as well we're going to worship God in prayer and we're going to praise him for who he is we're going to thank him for the many things he's given us and we're also going to say sorry for the things that we've done wrong so let's pray shall we our Heavenly Father 
We are glad to be in church this morning so that we can praise and worship you. You deserve our worship because on the one hand, you are a mighty God who created this vast universe. And because on the other, you love us individually and you care for us every single day of our lives. So we praise you, Lord, for creating this world in which we live, for high mountains and flowing rivers, for green fields and vast oceans. We offer you our praise. We thank you, too, for all those things that mean so much to us in our daily lives. Thank you for loving families where we feel secure. Thank you for friends with whom we love to spend our time. Thank you for our homes, for daily food and clothes to wear. Thank you for our schools and our jobs. And thank you for this place where we can worship you with our Christian brothers and sisters. But most of all, we want to thank you for the Lord Jesus, whom you sent to die for us so that we might be with you one day forever. Lord God, you are so good to us. Help us never, ever to take your goodness and your love for granted. But we also want to say sorry to you, Father, for all the wrong things in our lives. So we're sorry for the times when we have spoken an unkind word. We're sorry for not sharing what we have with other people. We're sorry for being more interested in our own well-being rather than other people's. And we're sorry too for being grumpy and moody when we've not got our own way. Please forgive us. Not because we deserve to be forgiven or because we have any merit of our own, but please forgive us because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us when the sinless one died for sinful men and women, boys and girls. And to him be praise and honour and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Well, we're going to sing another song of worship now. Uh, this is a, a fairly new song. I, I believe you know it here. It's one of my favourite songs that I've learned recently because it reminds us that whenever we, are, whenever we are tempted, whenever we feel that life has got nothing but trouble for us, whenever we feel that, that things are not going our way, we have a saviour who will keep us fast. So we're going to sing, When I fear my faith will fail, he will hold me fast. Let's stand and sing. Precious in 
be seated. And lovely to see a few boys and girls here this morning. And I want to say something to you in particular now, but we'll, we'll let the grown-ups listen in as well, shall we? Yeah, I think, good idea. Well, now, for some of you, it'll be half-term this coming week. And in a few days' time, we're all going to be celebrating the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Do any of the boys and girls know how many years does the word platinum represent? How many years? Yes! 70. Yes, absolutely right. Our Queen has been Queen for 70 whole years. Wow! That, that's even older than Matt. It, wow. Anyway, what I thought this morning, boys and girls, what I thought we'd do was a little quiz, okay? So I'm going to show you some pictures on the screen of some kings and queens. Now, some of them are real, and some of them are... are um, are cartoons and, and some of them from films and, and that sort of thing. But I want to see if you can identify these kings and queens. Some of them are very easy, but some of them are more difficult and you may need to ask a grown-up to help. Okay? So, Mike, can we have our first one up, please? Oh, there we are, kings and queens. First picture. Ah, now, who is that? Do, do any of the... Yes! Henry the Eighth, King Henry the Eighth. It couldn't be anyone else. That's a very famous picture of King Henry the Eighth. Now, this next one, I think, may be a little tricky, I thought. Thank you, John, for turning off the lights. That'll, that'll help. Where's Alan when you need him, eh? You know, that's his... That's his job. Anyway, here's the next one. Ooh, I, I, I think this is a bit trickier. Yes, do you know? It is. It's the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. That's right, Queen of Hearts. The next one, let's see. Thank you, Mike. Ooh. Ooh, now. Now. now I don't want to know the name of the movie. No, 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 no. That's, I, want to, I want the name of the king. Does anyone know? Okay, well, tell me the name of the film then. Yes. Frozen, yes. But does anyone remember the name of the king? Do any of the grown-ups know? You've wa Some of you will have watched it over and over and over again. No, you're right, it isn't. <laughs> I had to write this down because I had no idea. Agnar. Agnar. Well, there you are. Now you know. King Agnar from Frozen. Okay. All right. Matt, this next one, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Who's this then? King Daddy Pig. King Daddy Pig. <laughs> who, who else could... Who, who else? Yes. From, uh, and that's a story when... Daddy Pig apparently was king for the day. Yep. Next one. Ooh, now this king doesn't have a crown. Ooh, now. No, you're right. You're very good at this. You give. Yep. It is. It's Mufasa from The Lion King. That's right. Now, I think the next one is... I think it's the most difficult one of all, so let's see. Here we go. Ooh, now, it's Piers Brosnan, for those of you who... Not Frederick. No. Uh, <laughs> Frederick is not the right answer to any of these questions. Our consistent. Yeah. <laughs> now, does anyone know the film? It is Cinderella, yes, it is. It's that Cinderella, and it was, no, no one, no, I d hadn't a clue. Uh, King Rowan, apparently. 
from Cinderella. It was made a couple of years ago, I think, or it was released a, a couple of years ago. And the last one, okay, boys and girls, who is this? <laughs> the Queen. The Queen. I mean, it's just the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, who's 70 years on the throne we celebrate this week. But listen, boys and girls, when we come to church Sunday after Sunday, the main reason we do so is to worship a king. And that king is King Jesus. Do you know, when he was born, or near the time when he was born, wise men came looking for him. And do you know the question they asked? Well, it's this question here. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And do you know, when he died on the cross, they put a sign over him saying, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. But death wasn't the end. He rose again, he ascended into heaven, and today he is seated on the throne at God's right hand, and that's why we worship Jesus as King. Let's pray, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Queen and for all her many, many years of faithful service. But most of all this morning, we thank you for King Jesus. We thank you that he came to earth to be one of us. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his teaching. We thank you for the way that he healed people. We thank you that he died on the cross for our sakes. But he is now alive ascended into heaven, seated at your right hand, and one day we thank you, we will be with King Jesus forever. And to him be the honor and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, I think it's now time for you to go down the road to your classes. And now we're going to bring our morning intercessions to, to God. Over these last few months, of course, the situation in the Ukraine has been at the forefront of all our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, how dreadful it has been. And so in our intercessions this morning, we're going to be praying exclusively for that situation. And uh, I'm going to be uh, using, adapting, some prayers that have been provided by the organization CARE. So let's pray, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we lift up the situation regarding the Russian invasion of Ukraine because our hearts grieve when there's war and violence in the world and we want to pray for peace. But firstly, O oh God, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in the Ukrainian church who are standing in prayer, who are seeking you in the midst of this crisis, and who are serving others in need around them. Please, O oh God, fill them with the Holy Spirit and strengthen their faith in you as they worship and proclaim the truth of your word. Our Father, we pray that the freedom and security of Ukraine and other countries in the region will be defended and upheld in coming days and weeks. 
please raise up wise peacemakers and strategists who can act decisively to diffuse this perilous situation. Our Father, your word says that whoever is kind to the needy honors you. Thank you for the outpouring of generous hospitality for the millions fleeing from Ukraine. Please protect and guide and provide for these families and individuals as they journey and as they settle. And please enable your people, your church in this country, to stand together with refugees who need assistance. Grant that through UK churches, big and small, they will find the saving truth and grace of your gospel alongside life-giving physical provision and compassionate hospitality. But Father, we pray most of all for an end to hostilities, especially deadly attacks on civilians sheltering in basements and hospitals, schools and, and, uh, and so on. Please raise up on both sides those who desire to find ways to save lives and establish justice and truth. Please speak powerfully to those throughout the world who have powerful influence in this situation so that wisdom and compassion may prevail and evil overcome. Watch over, we pray, President Zelensky and others in the Ukrainian government and their families at this dangerous time. And as the fighting in Ukraine becomes focused on the east of that country, Lord, we pray that you would protect life. May vulnerable people be allowed to leave and find safety elsewhere. And we continue to pray that you will bring justice in this whole situation. And Father, we praise you and worship you because you hold all authority in your hands. We know you can bring great good out of even the most evil of situations. So please honour and exalt your name by saving many souls in Ukraine. And may your son's kingdom advance even amidst the darkness. For this we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And now, uh, Christine is going to bring our morning reading to us. I feel I should really give you some notices, but um, it's the reading instead. Um, the reading is taken from 2 Samuel, chapter 5 beginning to read at verse 1, and that's on page 308 if you're using a church Bible. David becomes king over Israel. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, 
you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Thank you very much indeed. So before we look at that passage together, um, we're going to sing again the, the song, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God.
So let's pray together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, as we come now to study the Scriptures, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're going to look this morning for a few minutes at 2 Samuel chapter 5 and those first 12 verses, and we're going to do so under the title, The Shepherd King. The Shepherd King. <coughs> Well, in just a few days' time, we'll, we will all be enjoying a back-to-back -back bank holiday to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And whether we are fervent supporters of royalty or not, we can all surely rejoice at Her Majesty's 70 years of selfless service to her people, and also to the fact that she has never made a secret of how important the Christian faith has been to her throughout her life. But for our thoughts this morning, I want to take us back not 70 years to when Princess Elizabeth became queen, but back closer to 3,000 years to the moment when David was crowned king over all Israel. And that moment is described for us in the Scriptures in 2 Samuel chapter 5. But before we look at the first 12 verses of this chapter together to see what we can learn from it, we need to spend a few moments to put everything in its context. What we're doing this morning by uh, taking this passage from 2 Samuel is a bit like climbing up a mountain but starting halfway up. Before we press ahead, we need to spend a few minutes getting our bearings. We need to understand exactly where we are in relation to what has gone before, before we stride out ahead into the terrain. So, after a lengthy period of time when the judges ruled over Israel, the people of Israel began to clamor for a king. Why? Well, because all the other nations around them had a king. Instead of being distinctive, Israel wanted to be like everyone else. And God, we're told, was angry with this demand. After all, he alone was their king. But he submitted to their request and Saul was anointed as the first king of Israel. Now, Saul was a poor king, and God rejected him, and instead told Samuel to go to an obscure backwater town, Bethlehem, and there anoint the youngest son of a man called Jesse as the next king of Israel. The lad's name was David. As David's fame grew, so did Saul's suspicions and anger about this young upstart. But David, although he had the opportunity on at least two occasions to kill King Saul, he refused to do any harm to the man he was called to succeed. When Saul eventually died, along with his son and David's dear friend, Jonathan, things turn ugly in Israel. The house of Saul wanted to remain in charge. And so a period of open conflict ensued between the house of Saul in the north and the house of David in the south. And this conflict is described in the opening verses, the opening chapters of 2 Samuel. Now, it's at this point, and I hope you're with me at, up till now, but because it's at this point that things begin to get complicated. So perhaps uh, a map 
will help us to uh, clarify things. And there we are. Now, I don't know how clear that is, but there we are. So, David is initially proclaimed king in Hebron, in Judah, in the south. Can you see the, 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 the southern part there? It's called Judah. And do you see Hebron right in the middle? That is where David's capital is when he is king of the southern part. Now, that was where David was from originally. So, it's no surprise that he's called, in the Bible, the king of Judah at this point. Although, actually, he was king over two tribes. There are two tribes there, Judah and Simeon. Now, up north, where the house of Saul regarded itself as continuing the rule of Saul, they retained the name Israel. Although from this point, it only referred to the northern, albeit the larger, part of the nation. So, the nation is temporarily divided in two. The house of Saul in the north, Israel, fighting the house of David in the south, Judah. However, all that said, as a result of his effective military campaigns, David is crowned king over all Israel, both north and south, in 2 Samuel chapter 5. So this is a highly significant moment in the history of Israel. Well then, please do take up your, your Bibles if you haven't already done so. And let's uh, look together, first of all, at verses 6 to 9. Uh, we'll come back to the first five verses a, 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 a little later. And I want you to note, firstly, that King David demonstrates godly common sense in his decision-making. That's the first lesson I want us to learn this morning. King David demonstrates godly common sense in his decision-making. So, having just been anointed king over all Israel, David has an important decision to make. Where is he going to establish his capital? Well, the answer is Jerusalem. And off David goes with his armies to subdue the Jebusites. They were the residents of Jerusalem, who quite frankly should have been ousted hundreds of years previously. Now, the Hebrew in these verses, verses 6 to 9, are really very difficult to understand. Uh, and uh, hence the rather uh, strange translations um, in our Bibles. But what is clear is that David was taunted and mocked as he approached the city. Do you see in verse 6, even the blind and lame can ward you off. But David captures the fortress, quite possibly by entering through a water shaft, or possibly by cutting off the city's water supply. And so the place became known both as the city of David and Zion, verse 7. The city of David and Zion. And that's the first time in the Bible that that name is given. And so Jerusalem, which is to become so important politically and theologically, is made the capital. What a canny decision that was. You see, if David had chosen Hebron, his capital in Judah, that would certainly have excited the jealousy of the northern tribes. But if he had chosen Gibeah, which was Saul's old capital, that would have outraged the southern tribes. Now, he he could have chosen his hometown of Bethlehem. 
But that would have struck too low a note. Bethlehem really was a tiny place. No, Jerusalem was just right, situated as it was, close to the border of the two different factions between Benjamin in the north and Judah in the south. Jerusalem, which had never before been captured by the Israelites, was truly a new capital city for a new era. No wonder John Stott has written that David showed statesmanlike qualities, not least in establishing Jerusalem as his capital. And no wonder F.B. Mayer says that David's choice of Jerusalem was a masterpiece of policy. You know, we sometimes play down the importance of being shrewd and canny, don't we? Maybe because it doesn't seem very spiritual. Surely if we're relying on the Spirit's leading and guiding, there is no place for sanctified common sense, we might be tempted to think. Well, I'm not so sure. Didn't the Lord Jesus tell the disciples to be as shrewd as snakes? It seems to me that as we allow the teaching of the Scriptures to take hold of our lives, and as we daily rely on the Spirit's prodding and prompting, and as we take counsel from wiser, trusted friends, then our decision-making will be characterized by a, a marriage of down-to-earth common sense on the one hand and godly wisdom on the other. I'm reminded of a story that Rob Parsons tells in one of his books. A young MP was trying to impress his constituents with his commitment to local matters but he found one man really very hard to please. The man would write nearly every month to complain about the state of a small patch of grass just beyond his boundary wall. It was full of weeds and he wanted the council to do something about it. <coughs> now the young MP tried to get the council to, to act but the minor nature of the request meant that nothing was ever done. So one Saturday morning, after receiving yet another missive about this wretched patch of grass, the MP had an idea. Later that day, he called on the man and asked him to come out with him to the street. And there was the small patch of grass weeded to perfection. How did you manage to persuade the council to do something at last? The constituent uh, inquired. I didn't, replied the MP. I did it myself and it took 20 minutes. Sometimes we Christians need to keep our wits about us and see if we can't make decisions which are both imaginative and creative. And it was certainly so for David when he chose Jerusalem as his capital. In the last section of our, our passage, we see another important lesson. King David is given an assurance of God's presence and blessings. King David is given an, an assurance of God's presence and blessings. Have a look at verse 10 for a moment. <clears throat> there, our writer makes clear that David's increasing power was due to the fact that God was with him. And in verse 12, we see that David has been established as king 
and that his kingdom has been exalted. David, King David, was in a pretty good place. But did you notice how the verse, verse 12, began? Have a look. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. He knew it. David had been given a deep assurance that he was the right man in the right place at the right time. Indeed, this is something that the scriptures so wish to emphasize that the very same expression is used in 1 Chronicles chapter 14 about this very situation. Here was something that David experienced and knew in the depths of his heart. I wonder how. How did David know that God had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom had been exalted? Well, no doubt, a, a number of matters combined to give David this sense of security and well-being. I, I strongly suspect, for example, that that momentous occasion when he was summoned from the fields where he was tending the sheep and was anointed by Samuel to be king, I imagine that played a huge part in his sense of reassurance. And then our text tells us that David now became more and more powerful, a, a sure sign that God was both with him and blessing him. And then in verse 11, we have Hiram, king of Tyre. Now, Hiram was from Phoenicia and would have been a natural enemy of David. But instead, Workers and hardware were sent to David so that Israel's new king could live in a splendid palace. God was using even the Gentile nations to help confirm David as God's man for Israel at this time. So do you see? A mixture of practical circumstances and God's certain promises, they combined to give David the certainty he now enjoyed. And David knew. He knew. I think that sometimes we Christians miss a trick when it comes to assurance. Now, I'm not referring here to the assurance of our salvation, which has been won for us by our Saviour. In this regard, we, we rejoice that no one or nothing can ever pluck us out of his hand. Now, I'm not referring here to our salvation, but to our daily walk with God. There ought to be times, I believe, there ought to be times, specific times in our lives, when we know, like David long ago, that at this moment, we are in God's place doing his work to the very best of our ability. Do you know the story of Charles Simeon? He, he was born in 1759. He came from a, a well-to-do background and he attended Eton and then uh, Trinity College, Cambridge, where he came to faith. Having been ordained at the age of 23, he was asked by the bishop to be minister of Holy Trinity in Cambridge. And this is when his problems began. The congregation, you see, didn't want Simeon, and they did everything to obstruct him. For example, there was an afternoon service, but the congregation refused to let Simeon preach at it. For, for seven years, they even invited an outsider to take the service. 
He, Simeon tried to start an evening service, but the church wardens locked him out. One Sunday morning, the pew owners locked their pews. They refused to attend worship and wouldn't let anyone else use their pews. So what did Simeon do? Well, he went out and bought some chairs and benches for use in the church. But when he turned his back, the wardens broke the chairs and threw all the pieces into the churchyard. The opposition and harassment went on for 30 years. Once, in the middle of all this trouble, a friend asked Simeon why he didn't just leave. And this was his reply. Because I believe I have been called by God to these people and this place. Yeah? I believe I've been called by God to these people and this place. And Simeon stayed there for 59 years because he knew it was right for him. You know, I believe that that ought to be our experience more often than we realize. Occasions when we know deep down that we are in God's place for us. Of course, we have to be wary at this point, don't we? Because sometimes we can be so lethargic or complacent about where we are that just because we are in a place to which God called us once, we idly or arrogantly assume that it is still His purpose for us to be in that place today. And it seems to me that godly Christian people will prayerfully reflect from time to time on what He is calling us to do and where. But on the other hand, we ought to avoid that kind of worry and anxiety and stress which means that we are never content about where we are. We are never at peace with the task to which God has called us. In essence, that's a type of unbelief and it should be shunned. Now, like David and Charles Simeon, there will surely be times in our lives when we know that where we are is certainly the place God has called us to. And so we go back to the start of the chapter for our final lesson. And it's this. <clears throat> King David, a shepherd of Israel, points forward to his greater son, And I'm sure it will appear on the screen any moment now. There we are. There's our final lesson. In these opening verses of the chapter, which are in effect David's coronation, we note that David does not foist himself on the people, even though Samuel had anointed him to be king. But rather, do you see, at the start of the chapter, it is the people who come to ask David to be king. And in verses 1 and 2, they give three reasons for doing so. Firstly, he's one of theirs. He's their kith and kin. He's their own flesh and blood, they say. Then secondly, they admire his military prowess and his leadership skills. You were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns, they declared. But thirdly, and even more important than his personal relationship and his track record, there is his divine appointment. He was God's man, for it was God who said to David, you will shepherd and you shall become their ruler. Do you see in verse 2? You shall shepherd my people Israel and you shall become 
their ruler. Isn't it wonderful how the one-time shepherd boy should now be designated as shepherd over Israel? And what an appropriate picture for the leader of God's people. For just as a shepherd will lead and guide his flock, just as he cares for and provides for them, just as he will be in turns tender and tough as circumstances demand, just as he always searches for the sheep that has gone astray until he finds it, and just as he protects his flock even to the point of being prepared to lay down his life for them, so David will do the same for Israel. And in doing so, do we not see a pointer towards great David's greater son? Do we not see a pointer towards the one who was the good shepherd? Now, some of you at this point will want to say, perhaps, that I'm reading too much into this one text, that I'm reading 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 2 with New Testament eyes. Well, you might. You might just have a case were it not for two remarkable verses in Ezekiel chapter 34. So as we close, please turn with me to these astonishing verses. So Ezekiel chapter 34, I think you'll find it on page 866 of the Church Bibles, if you've got one to hand. Page 866, Ezekiel chapter 34. Now why am I taking you there? Well, in this chapter, God, through the prophet Ezekiel, is railing against the leaders of Israel, uh, whom he calls in this chapter the shepherds of Israel. And why is God railing against the shepherds of Israel? Because of their neglect and their selfishness and their lack of compassion. That's why. And so over and over again in Ezekiel 34, God says that he himself will be a shepherd over Israel. But look carefully at verses 23 and, 20 and 24 of Ezekiel 34. And note how the Sovereign Lord expresses this. Now just listen to this if you haven't got it. I will place over them one shepherd my servant David. And he will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Do you see what God is doing here? He's taken the language used by the tribes of Israel in 2 Samuel 5 and to, applies them to the situation in Israel at the start of the exile. In other words, we're talking three and a half centuries after David's death. So do you see, David died three and a half centuries before Ezekiel 34. Yet God says there that I will place over them one shepherd, my, she my servant David. So who is this David, this shepherd about whom the prophet speaks? It is, of course, the Lord Jesus who came as a shepherd for his people who came to care for us and protect us, who came to lay down his life for us so that we, who like sheep have gone astray, might return to his fold. My friends, this week we will be encouraged to look back and reflect. And as we do so, 
we will remember, I hope, with thanksgiving, our Queen and her 70 years of faithful service. But let us also remember King David. King David and his astute decision-making. King David and his firm assurance that he was God's man in God's place at just the right time. And let us also remember that we have a king, King Jesus, who as our shepherd not, not only meets all our needs, not only cares for us with an everlasting love, but gave his life for our sakes, bearing our sins in his body. And to him be all honour and glory and praise, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons that we have learnt this morning. And we thank you, most of all, that even in the midst of Old Testament history, we see King Jesus. King Jesus, who is our ruler. King Jesus, who is the Good Shepherd. And may we live lives this week which will reflect well on Him and bring Him glory. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And so we're going to uh, sing our final song together, The Lord's My Shepherd. Let's stand and sing.
And as we finish, shall we say the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.